Yeah. Maybe we can get a box if you want. This is Dan McHugh at the Unispace 82 conference, and I'm talking to Mr. Charles Lee, who is director of the Space Transportation Company of Princeton, New Jersey, the private enterprise that is going to pay a billion dollars to buy a shuttle from the United States government. He comes from a strong background in international finance, as formerly he was vice chairman of White Weld and Company, a prominent international investment banking firm. I wanted to ask him after hearing the very interesting proposal of Dr. Klaus Heiss if he actually believes that there are people who will pay money to purchase this shuttle. Well, Dan, uh, we think that there are people who will pay money to invest in this project. Uh, it sh I should point out that initially our investors will be limited to U.S. investors for a variety of reasons uh, to do with the research and development expense that's already gone into. Uh, the shuttle program, but in our view, uh, if we can make the arrangements which we have proposed with NASA, uh, we can get uh, professional institutional investors uh, to support this project with their money uh, in the amount of a billion dollars or more, yes sir. Is that an unusual type of investment for this type of risk? Well, I think it's fair to say that uh, such an investment has never been made before, but there are similar there are analogous investments which have been made in history. Uh, one goes back to uh, the federal land grants for the railroad industry. Uh, one goes back to uh, recent history, the Alaska Pipeline, I think, is a project not dissimilar to this one. Uh, the Alaska Purchase, even the Louisiana Purchase have similarities to this. Uh, institutional investors uh, usually are very careful conservative investors who are looking for an assured rate of return, but typically they try to improve on that rate of return somewhat, and they have a small, minor fraction of their funds to invest in projects as uh, risky as ours is. Ah, I understand already one uh, prominent uh, sober corporation has come forward. Uh, which is that? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, the Prudential Insurance Company of Newark, New Jersey, uh, one of the largest insurance companies in the world, and certainly in the United States, uh, is now a financial partner with Spacetran uh, in this project. Uh, their initial investment is somewhat modest uh, in the form of equity, but clearly they would not, make, not have made that investment were they not interested in the, in the further opportunities. They're also going to be involved, I understand, in uh, satellite communications, I believe, through uh, satellite business systems. Uh, I believe you're referring to the Aetna Insurance, which uh, is a partner with ComSat and IBM in satellite business systems. But insurance companies are beginning to be interested in the, no question about the space it. area. Insurance companies who have millions of dollars to invest every day with their policyholders' money uh, are always looking for new ways to invest that money prudently, and space is the newest of those areas. Hmm. So it's becoming more common. Yes, unquestionably. Have any other uh, investors uh, approached you at all? Uh, we've been approached by uh, a number of, of financial institutions in the United States. Uh, we have approached none ourselves. We have been approached, uh, and to this point, we have simply had conversations, nothing definitive. If the deal goes through, what kind of schedule do you expect where you will be paying money, and who will you pay the money to? Well, this would be a typical project. Uh, uh, financing where we would expect to place a firm order with the supplier for the orbiter uh, and at that time would probably require a 15 20 percent down payment uh, with delivery not to occur for five years or thereabouts. Uh, production payments would take place along the way. That would be to Rockwell not to the government. Now, Rockwell is the supplier so we presumably would be paying Rockwell. I see. Uh, how do you feel that the issues being discussed here at Unispace by all the different countries of the world. How do you feel that affects your opportunities? Does it create barriers or does it open up new opportunities for you? Well, I would say the general tenor of these meetings, and I haven't heard many of them, but the general tenor would be supportive of our project. Uh, uh, the peaceful uses of space certainly are consistent with what we're trying to do. Uh, so I would say they were supportive. Do you think there'll be foreign investors eventually in this type of project? Eventually is a long word, uh, a long time. Initially, we, are, we propose, uh, uh, for what we consider to be obvious reasons, to limit the investments to U.S. investors. 
But clearly there will be foreign investors. Certainly there will be foreign users, as I'm sure Dr. Heiss has explained. Do you think that this could lead eventually to a similar type of financing for larger projects, such as space stations or power stations in space? Not necessarily your particular I understand, company, I understand. but the president. Uh, there, there's no question in my mind that if Space Tran and NASA and the U.S. government can work out a format uh, acceptable to NASA and the Congress, uh, that this could be used for uh, further exploitation or exploration in space. There's no question. So this opens up a whole new era of private investment in space? Uh, we think so. We think so. Okay. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. We've been speaking to Mr. Charles Lee, director of the Space Transportation Company of Princeton, New Jersey, a company that plans to buy a space shuttle. This is Dan McHugh at Unispace 82. This is Dan McHugh with the NGOs at. This is I hope they don't pick up that noise in the background. Oh, they loved it. That's kind of scary. Okay. This is Dan McHugh with the NGOs at Unispace 82. I'm speaking to Dr. John Logsdon director of the graduate program in science, technology, and public policy at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Dr. Logston, as a space historian, could you briefly characterize how the space program has come to its current juncture, where we are seriously entertaining private investment as opposed to large-scale public programs of the past? Well, this October will mark the 25th anniversary of the first satellite flight. And I think, uh, like uh, the first 25 years of a human life, uh, is preparation for what follows, that uh, the space program is beginning to en a enter a phase of maturity, a phase of, of return on investment, so that it is attractive not only to governments but to private investors, and, and that uh, governments uh, will increasingly go into partnership with the private sector in those areas of space uh, for which there can be identifiable, practical, and profitable returns. This is a very interesting time for public reaction to the space program. We have a long period where it has not been popular to spend money on space, yet the younger generation seems very enthusiastic about space in their movies and so forth. Do you think that this will play a role as that generation grows older? I think so. In the United States, which is where I'm most familiar with the situation, the, uh, there's been a steady upward trend in popular support for space over the past few years. It's been concentrated in the under 30 uh, part of the population, and, and those are the people that are getting to the positions of, of economic and, and political influence uh, if their support carries on. If the space activities pay off in, in not only economic but in, in beneficial applications for society, I think they'll become a, a routine part of human life, one that uh, will be part of, of what we do, yes. One of the controversial aspects of speaking about the benefits of space is the role of the military. Do you think that with a large growing nuclear freeze movement and so forth in the United States that the space program could be entangled in this if uh, this feature became too prominent? Well, I think they're, they're somewhat separable issues, but indeed uh, there are very real military applications in space. Uh, one could make an, an argument that the surveillance and reconnaissance applications of space are stabilizing rather than destabilizing forces for the world's security. And, and uh, uh, whether we can uh, negotiate a limit on arms in space in the next five or seven years, and I think that's all we've got, I think is really one of the key issues of the day. Do you think that uh, a major politician will ever make a decision again like John Kennedy did to go to the moon, say to go to Mars or to build some large project that would have direct benefits? Or is that era over? Well, in 1961, when Kennedy committed the United States to the moon, it was the right answer for the situation at that time. If space were 
something that uh, was the right answer for a broader political and national purpose than just space alone, and a national leader believed that. I think that commitment could happen, but I don't see it happening uh, any time in the next decade or so, with the possible exception of a military response to a military challenge. That issue has also come up here at the Unispace Conference. What do you think the outcome of this conference will mean for the American space program in the long run in terms of the world's attitude toward it? Well, I think that Unispace 82 is part of a rather painful process for the United States of recognizing that we cannot make up our own mind how we're going to run our space program, that there are many other space programs and that all nations of the world are interested in space and that the U.S activities in space have to uh, operate in that context in a way that uh, increases uh, the benefit to the world as well as to the United States. One final question. There have been many uh, speculations as to historical analogies to our current situation, as to the opportunities that are arising. As an historian, are there any uh, particular ones that stand out in your mind? Well, as a historian, uh, one of the first things that you learn is to be skeptical of historical <laughs> analogies. The notion that we're at the beginning of a new age of discovery like the uh, uh, transoceanic voyages of the 16th century I think is, is very uh, unlikely. I don't think that there are places out there uh, with the kind of at least short-term century or two payoffs of, of, of North and South America and, and, and Asia for, for this part of the world. Uh, we're developing a new technology, we're trying to understand a new capability, and historically and inevitably we're going to use that in ways that are uh, of interest and benefit to uh, those that control it, and I think that will happen in space too. Thank you. We've been speaking with Dr. John Logston of the Georgetown University. This is Dan McHugh with the NGOs at Unispace 82. Okay. okay. Of, of North and South America and, and, and Asia for, for this part of the world. Uh, we're developing a new technology, we're trying to understand a new capability, and historically and inevitably we're going to use that in ways that are uh, of interest and benefit to uh, those that control it, and I think that will happen in space too. Thank you. We've been speaking with Dr. John Logston of the Georgetown University. This is Dan McHugh with the NGOs at Unispace 82. Okay. okay. <laughs> es gibt kein Leben ohne Valuli so. Wasser, Luft, Licht, Sonne. Der Mensch soll die Technik beherrschen, aber die Technik darf nicht und niemals den Menschen beherrschen. Ich bin 70 Jahre alt und ich will der Menschheit sagen, lebet friedlich, so können wir unser Paradies auf Erden aufbauen. Und dass der mehr ihr unzufrieden seid, desto mehr gefährdet ihr den Weltfrieden. Und man weiß nicht, was man im Weltall rüstet für uns oder gegen uns. Und damit schweige ich eine Schweigeminute für den Frieden.